Welcome to the Casual Historian Podcast. My name is Grant, and this is my co-host, James. Hello, everyone. This is the podcast where me and my friend, a pair of history buffs, talk about all the things that we don't get to talk to in our history classes. And today, it is James' topic. You know, uh, today is going to be a fun topic for me, because I'm a masochist. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's also very topical. Um, uh, earlier uh, in uh, February, uh, David Cameron, uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, announced that June 23rd uh, would be the date of a referendum on whether or not the United Kingdom would remain in the European Union, uh, which is itself the culmination of something that kind of started... uh, in the aftermath of World War II, um, in, in Zurich, Switzerland, in 1946, Winston Churchill referred to the need for a United States of Europe. Um, and obviously, the United States, where we are, uh, is a federal uh, mm-hmm. state. So what we're going to talk about uh, today is a look, where it's going to be a look at uh, federalism in Europe. Um, it's many shades, shapes, colors, and how admirable it can be um, in terms of a clean structure or sometimes how messy it can be. This is one of the things that I am not extremely knowledgeable about, but I know just enough to ask questions to have my co-host elaborate a lot more on. So let's start with the only thing I am very familiar with in terms of federalism in Europe, and that is Germany, or as I learned in my German class in high school, the Bundes... Stupid lips. The Bundesrepublik of Deutschland. So... I guess I'm, I'm I'm familiar with American federalism and the divide of power between the federal central government and the state governments. But what I guess, what is the divide of power between, say, the central government in Germany and all of its state governments? Well, you know, it, uh, I'm glad you led with Germany because understanding European federalism, uh, really, you have to understand Germany's federalism. Um and, and before I answer a question, I'm just going to throw this out there for our listeners. Um, a federal state is different from a unitary state. Uh, a unitary state is a country where there are no autonomous or self-governing subdivisions that uh, pretty much all power is vested in one central authority. An example of that would be France. Um There are local governments, of course, but it's not federal. All legislative power resides with the government in Paris, Um, whereas Germany is a federal state in which there is both federal power at a national level in Berlin, as well as the uh, powers of the uh, states or the Länder of Germany uh, in their respective capitals. Hmm. But uh, the the relation of um, power between a uh, the federal government or the uh, the the Bundestag uh, in in Berlin and the governments of the Lander in Germany um, is not nearly as adversarial as the relationship <laughs> between uh, Washington and state capitals in the U.S. can be at times. Uh, uh, the U.S. has a long history of its federalism because it sprang into existence uh, first as a confederacy where uh, it was too loosely joined to be effective. Um, and then with the introduction of the U.S. Constitution has generally been an ongoing tension between either centralizing power in Washington or um, maintaining power in the states. And I'm not going to, you know, go into an issue of, you know, American states' rights or whatever, because that's a totally separate issue. Um, but Germany has never really had the, the quite the same issues the U.S. had um, in its approach to federalism. In fact, in a lot of ways, um, everyone put your hipster glasses on. Germany was federalist before federalism was really a concretely um, notioned uh, political structure. And the reason I say that is because you have to go back, back in time to a time when a map of Europe looked like someone dropped a stained glass window. Uh, And what I'm referring to in this case is the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, The Holy Roman Empire now comprises what will comprise what are now uh, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Austria, the Czech Republic, Western Poland, Northeastern France, Northern Italy, and Slovenia. And it's also worth noting that of those, you know, you have not only Germany as a federation, but you also have federations in Belgium, Austria, and Switzerland as a confederacy. But, you know, it's interesting, though, because the reason why the empire plays a role in this federal structure is that over time, the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire were increasingly weak. 
they weren't a hereditary uh, monarchy. They had to be elected, even though by practice, monarchs came from just one dynasty. But their ability to actually exert direct power over all of the empire was limited. Emperors pretty much only had direct control over their own territory. So for most of its history, for the Habsburgs, that would have referred to pretty much what's now Austria and the Czech Republic and a few other smaller states. The other territories ruled by an assembly of you know, feudal rulers like dukes, margraves, or counts, um, imperial knights, uh, clergy in the prince bishoprics and prince archbishoprics, um, were pretty much had, had control over their own territories. Hmm. However, by the uh, Thirty Years' War, um, the Reformation has kind of driven a polarizing wedge between uh, the Catholics in the empire and the two big groups of Protestants on the other. You have you know Lutherans uh, and Calvinists. And uh, the introduction of the principle of cuius regio eius religio, or who rules their religion, uh, becomes the, the mainstay, which is the idea that nobody, not even the emperor, can interfere in the decision of whatever member state of the empire chooses for its religion. <laughs> Um, And this lays a cornerstone for the way Germany will go on to develop. At its height, the empire had 300 member states. 300. That's messy. Um, By the time we get to the French Revolutionary Wars, um, there was what was called the mediatization, in which this large number is reduced to less than 100 states. And by the uh, Congress of Vienna, when the Napoleonic Wars end, Germany has about 48 states uh, that remain. Um, You have big states like Austria and Prussia to mid-sized states like Bavaria and Hanover, and still, you know, small little micro states like, you know, uh, the Principality of Hohenzollern, Hechingen and Sigmaringen and uh, the old free cities of uh, Bremen, Hamburg and Lübeck and Frankfurt. Um, As Germany unifies, uh, its approach is unique because we look at Germany's nearest uh, neighbor, uh, great power, France. Mm -hmm. France became a unitary state, um, not so much because of... uh, it, the the ability of a monarch to be extremely powerful, but because of certain circumstances that resulted in France becoming more unitary. France, like Germany, was once divided into a bunch of duchies and counties, mm-hmm. but over time... Uh, as results of the Hundred Years' War and other conflicts resulted in uh, large amounts of French nobility simply dying and these major tower, major titles reverting to the King of France, who could then give them out as mm-hmm. kind of honorifics, mm-hmm. um, feudal power became vested solely in the person of the monarch of France. Whereas in Germany, there were consistently many monarchs. And indeed, when Germany does unify Mm -hmm. as the German Empire, it is actually a federation because you have the emperor, who is also the king of Prussia, but you still have kings in Bavaria, in Saxony and other countries within the empire. And interestingly enough, in the imperial model for Germany, some of the other states like Bavaria or Saxony still had their own armies. And in fact, had their own foreign services. So over time, that ideal has persisted. After World War I, when the empire gives way to the Weimar Republic, the federation is maintained. In fact, it's the internal boundaries are exactly the same. It's just that instead of kings and dukes and counts, you have free states. And then uh, the Nazi interlude is the only time that Germany was a unitary state. Um, After World War II, uh, boundaries are somewhat redrawn, but once again, a federal model is instituted in Western Germany and then later on reunified Germany. And humorously enough, even that feature I mentioned where uh, the kingdoms uh, of the empire still had uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign Uh, ministries, nowadays, German states are potentially subjects of international law. They can actually sign treaties in their own right if they have uh, consent from the uh, Bundestag in Berlin. Ah, So, I guess, you mentioned early part of your... uh, You mentioned in the early part that the kind of federalism we see in Germany is less adversarial than it is here in the States. I guess you may have mentioned this and I may have not picked it up, but what in particular makes it less 
adversarial as in, uh, I guess, why is there less conflict between the central government and the state governments? Well, first off, the the German constitution is much more detailed um, than ours is. Uh, The second one is that the current Germany, the current federal Germany, is just the latest in a series of incarnations of some sort of German entity. You know, before the current German Republic, you have Nazi Germany, which I'll I'll pass over because it of its how odd it is in German history, structurally speaking. Then you have before that Weimar Germany, Imperial Germany, the German Confederation, you have the Napoleonic Confederation of the Rhine of puppet states, and you have the Empire before that. But in all of these, the common denominator is the idea that the states, the lander of Germany, as they're called now, have an element of self-governance an element of culture that has existed there for centuries. And so, you know, the, I I guess you could say that, you know, the national governments and their structures may have come and gone, but the local smaller governments in Germany always maintained their existence. Uh, For example, you know, the well-known state of Bavaria in Germany as it is now is geographically almost exactly the same as the old kingdom of Bavaria that existed um, during the 19th century, which itself was just an expanded version of the old duchy. So, you know, in Germany, you know, you don't have a situation where the federal government is in a position to really try to gain more power at the expense of states nowadays, mostly because, one, their constitution is clear enough to disallow that, but also because simply centuries of culture and history that do help shape identity uh, would prevent that. So basically you're saying the reason that it's less adversarial is because the central government in Germany acknowledges that, yes, you have existed longer than we have. You have these rights. You have this history. And we're going to acknowledge that and let you have it. While here in the United States, the individual states, most of them did not have most of them did not exist before the United States came into existence in any form. And the ones that did weren't really super independent beforehand. Right. In, in the case of the United States, you know, on independence, you know, we have the Articles of Confederation and then a short time after we have the Constitution. But before that, they were simply colonial governments, you know, mm-hmm. 13 colonial governments under the sovereignty of Great Britain. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Germany, you had, you know, eat up to 300, of course, but you had a situation where, uh, You had states that were in many ways functionally independent, Um, you know, the ability to raise their own armies, levy taxes, um, uh, all things which the colonial governments in the United States were generally not proficient at doing on their own. Uh, So, you have centuries of evolution in Germany of, you know, individual states that eventually do accrete into, you know, the recognizable forms we have now, whereas with the U.S. you have the leap from... Uh, uh, colonial governments answerable to a central authority in London become independent, and there was something of a culture shock. You know, there there was this uh, the the sudden lack of a central authority uh, was problematic. The Confederation mm-hmm. didn't work. So then we have the Constitution created, which creates a strong central government um, in in Washington. But there was from get go a great deal of tension as to how much power Washington should exert vis-a-vis the states. Hmm. I see. So that is interesting. I I am American. My specialty is American history. And I could tell you that all the colonies thought of themselves as being independent countries of their own. But adding this perspective of how much longer these German states have been their own entities, even though the United States became a political entity on the modern world stage before modern Germany did is it's, it's really interesting. I'm definitely going to have to look more into that part of German history in order to give that self a bit more perspective. But I guess. OK, so now I guess I think we should move on to the UK and its lack of federalism. Yeah, it, it, it's important to note that uh, the UK is an example of what can happen um, when a federal model is not uh, in play. And it's important to understand also that, you know, in, for example, Germany or the US, the federal government derives its sovereignty uh, from the combined agreement, basically, of the member states. Uh, as a matter of fact, the very word federalism or federation, the root word uh, fedus means 
means covenant or treaty in mm. Latin. Um, and in in German, uh, the, you, you'll hear terms like Bundesrat mm-hmm. or Bundestag, yeah. um, which yeah. actually means, is a cognate of the word bond mm-hmm. uh, in English. So the UK, um, on its, uh, uh, the foundation of its current form is based in 1707 on the Act of Union. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, for uh, about a century and a half, uh, England and Scotland were ruled by the same monarch in personal union, mm-hmm. um, but they each were still uh, governed by their own local powers in London and Edinburgh. But when the Acts of Union took place, it wasn't that they said, we are now going to form Great Britain and then England and Scotland will remain somewhat separate in some way. What actually took place was that at that moment, the monarchies of England and Scotland ceased to exist and were replaced with a new monarchy, the monarchy of Great Britain. Similarly, there was now no longer a Parliament of England and a Parliament of Scotland. Those were dissolved and replaced with a Parliament of the United Kingdom. And later on to that would be added Ireland. So the UK, as we know it, is, technically speaking, a unitary state. All power is derived from the central government in London, even though, as you may be aware, there are governments uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland, in Wales, and in Northern Ireland. But these are called devolved governments. They have their power via a grant of sorts from the central government in London or in Westminster, Uh, which means, technically speaking, that the government could then legally uh, revoke the devolved status um, of one of these governments, as did happen in Northern Ireland during the 1970s. Mm. But I think, uh, you know, this is an important example because one feature of federalism is not merely that the members all come together to form a whole, but there's a sense that each member is equal to another. Mm. For example, in Germany, you have the well-populated state of Bavaria is constitutionally equal to the tiny little free city of Hamburg, uh, as far as the law goes. But in the UK, uh, devolution, in, rather than federalism, has been piecemeal and on a kind of ad hoc basis. So Scotland's parliament has mm-hmm. a great deal of power, but that was negotiated directly with Scotland itself uh, from London. Uh, similarly, the peace process in Northern Ireland created the structure of the Northern Ireland executive, whereas uh, and whereas both Scotland and Northern Ireland have uh, pretty much agreements that say you can do whatever you like except for these things which are reserved for uh, the UK parliament like foreign policy Mm -hmm. or defense policy Mm -hmm. for example Mm -hmm. then you have Wales where instead of having reserved powers for Westminster Westminster says these are what we let you do Um, and that's potentially problematic for the future of the UK uh, because in terms of actual scope and power uh, Scotland is not equal to Northern Ireland is not equal to Wales and England itself has no devolved government whatsoever uh, and is dependent solely on Westminster for all of its lawmaking powers. Yes, but I'm willing to bet you'll have the Scots and the uh, Welsh and the Irish willing to say, well, the British government in London is the English government, which I guess you could sort of say was because in reality, the English Parliament pretty much did just absorb the Scottish Parliament when the Act of Union happened. Effectively, yes. Uh, legally speaking, no. Um, I guess that might be what they call legal fiction in this case. Um, but there is a very strong sense uh, in Northern Ireland, in Wales, and especially in Scotland, that uh, the Westminster government is uh, a predominantly English body. They are absolutely right. Um, England uh, on its own supplies far more members of Parliament than uh, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland combined, um, which means that the English do drive laws. Um, but there, there is also a kind of a reverse problem, uh, which is uh, why federalism might be a, a solution the UK should seriously consider in its future, um, if it wants to actually remain a united kingdom. Uh, <laughs> England, with its utter lack of representation, means that with most of its laws being voted on in Westminster directly, 
uh, despite the introduction of a recent uh, standing order, which is English votes for English laws. Up until this point, Scottish MPs, Northern Irish MPs, and Welsh MPs could vote on laws that affect English citizens. But if there were areas such as, for example, education, which are devolved to all three, uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, um, English MPs have no votes there. But Scots, Northern Irish, or Welsh could vote on education in for basically for England, um, which is partly why, you know, this, this is um, – it's messy, and the British approach uh, has uh, created more problems really than it's solved. Yes, it, so- it sounds like that, but I guess the federal kingdom of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland doesn't sound as catchy as united. Well, you don't even need to say federal. It would just be uh, an adjustment of how uh, the regions interact. And you don't even necessarily, uh, you may not even necessarily want to have England be a single federal subject. Um <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, a single federal subject in such a structure, um, because uh, there are vast cultural differences in different parts of England, um, arguing perhaps for a return to the old county system. Uh, those Northumbrians, they're always causing problems. <clears throat> uh, not to mention the Cornish. Well, the Cornish, they're just Welsh and they don't want to say they're Welsh. <laughs> But, you know, it, what's happening in, in the UK is really in a, a, a symptomatic of what happens when you do have uh, greater desires for self-government um, and, you know, federalism or federations uh, can be created uh, where there wasn't one before. Um, an example of this is Belgium. Uh, Belgium uh, became independent in the early 19th century uh, after spending centuries of being part of other people's countries. Um, it was, gained its independence from the Netherlands. Before that, it was under French control. Before that, Austrian. Before that, Spanish. Before that, Burgundian, which was basically French anyway. Um, but by the time uh, we get to the uh, 19th century, uh, the Northern Netherlands, what we now call the Netherlands, um, are largely uh, Protestant, uh, Calvinist specifically. Um, whereas the Southern Netherlands, what's now Belgium and Luxembourg, uh, were largely Catholic. Um, at the time, this was enough to provide something of a national identity, <laughs> that they did not want to be ruled by an absolute Protestant monarch. So they seceded, became the Kingdom of Belgium, a constitutional monarchy ruled by a Catholic. Well, a, a Protestant who converted to Catholicism mm. because dynastic reasons. <laughs> but Belgium, uh, as society has become more and more secular, religious denomination has not been enough to keep Belgium together because Belgium geographically actually comprises two distinct ethnicities or two distinct linguistic groups. Uh, One, uh, Flanders or the Flemish uh, in the west and north of the country uh, who are who speak Flemish, which is a dialect of Dutch, uh, part of the West Saxon group. And in the south and east of the country, the Walloons, who speak a variant of French. And uh, tension uh, exists basically between the two groups. So as a measure of addressing this, a federal model was proposed, which might seem odd for a country as small as Belgium. Um, But it is working somewhat to allay tension between the two, uh, in which there is a Wallonia for the French speakers, Mm -hmm. Flanders for the Flemish speakers, and the area around Brussels uh, is a third entity as well. Uh, Each of these groups is self-governing, have their own governments. Uh, but are answerable uh, to overall to the central government in Brussels. Yeah, that's one of the situations I have heard of with uh, not in regards to federalism, but in uh, threats of dividing and seceding parts of European countries. And it just sort of seems like it's one of those things that it's not going to hold on forever without uh, something nasty happening. Kind of like how the Spanish constantly hold on to Catalonia. Well, the, the Spanish uh, holding, clinging to Catalonia um, and also uh, the Basque country um, are examples of why devolved government is so dangerous. Because technically speaking, Spain is in fact a unitary state. But due to the strength of feeling um, in, uh, in the country, both in terms of its maintaining its existing form, um, juxtaposed with the desire for greater autonomy and self-governance, um, 
in uh, Catalonia and in the Basque country, there's a great deal of tension. Um, and so the the intractability of the governments in Madrid to provide uh, a truly federal model um, are actually making the situation worse, mm-hmm. I would say. Because, you know, he, there have been uh, movements to devolve power to both the Basques and to the Catalans, to other mm-hmm. groups in Spain. Uh, like the British model, it's very haphazard, mm-hmm. very ad hoc. And because, again, in a devolved state, the power, in theory, can be taken away at any time. Whereas in Germany or in the U.S., the central government can't simply say, you no longer have this power. Whereas in theory, the Spanish parliament or the U.K. parliament could, with one motion, strip the rights of, say, the Basque, the Catalans, um, which uh, is very dangerous if one wants to see the, the country move forward. Hmm. Well, then, I guess since we're already on the continent of Europe, let's move on to, I guess, the crux of this idea of federalism in Europe and the uh, I'm not sure whether to call it a lack of federalism or just badly designed federalism in the European Union. Right. So the European Union, uh, in many ways, is still really much more of a confederation than a, a federation. Um, I mentioned Churchill's quote where he speaks of the United States of Europe. Um, and it, it, the European Union, I must say, has actually done important things. It and its predecessor organizations uh, did a very important job of, one, helping Europe recover from World War II um, and promoting a new spirit of cooperation and friendliness among European governments, uh, which was really revolutionary. Mm-hmm. I mean, considering that for, for the <laughs> previous few centuries yeah. of human history, uh, European governments fighting each other had led to some of the most devastating conflicts the world had ever seen. Well, you can only bash each other's head in so often with one of those bashings involving genocide <laughs> before people just sort of lose all energy to do it. Exactly. And so the Europeans finally got wise to the idea that they could achieve more um, by grouping together rather than expending their energy trying to kill each other. And the EU um, has been the product of that dream. And I think that that concept is not so much uh, a scary one, but the EU itself has become uh, very, very difficult. Uh, The average citizen of any country may not be able to explain to you very well how their own government works. Mm -hmm. Trying to explain the EU uh, and the radically complicated treaties that create it, um, its odd processes, uh, becomes frustrating. It becomes so remote and obtuse that uh, it can lose legitimacy in the eyes of the beholder. Its parliament has almost no initiative on its own. The European Parliament uh, can only debate legislation proposed by the Commission. Members of the Commission are appointed by uh, the individual member governments. And then I won't even get into the uh, odd uh, distinctions between the Council of Europe, the European Council, and the Council of the European Union, all of which exist but are separate from each other and do different jobs. Uh, I think that uh, because of the pace of integration, there are some who do truly want to see a federal Europe. And I think you especially see these groups in uh, in France, in Germany, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Italy, basically the mm-hmm. core of Europe. Um, but some of the the newer uh, states may be less enthusiastic about it, uh, especially those in Eastern Europe. Some might be too weak to be able to contribute effectively, like say Greece in its present form. Yeah, though I think though there is a desire amongst the elites in the core countries of the European Union to have a more uh, federalized system. I think the issue is that they all imagine what this federalized system would look like would be differently. I mean, the Germans have a different aspiration and view for the European Union than the French do. Well, I, I, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. Um, the The treaties uh, commit Europe to ever closer union, uh, which, by the way, is one of the big objections the the Brits have developed recently mm-hmm. in terms of you know why this referendum is happening. Britain's now exempt from it um, because Britain likes to pretend that it's on an island off the coast of Europe so much as it thinks that it's, you know, um, a continent like North America. But the the what's called the Franco-German motor 
uh, this co- this core of cooperation has really been what's driven uh, European integration. Uh, and it's really interesting because even when you have uh, leaders of both countries of different ideological stripes, for example, you have uh, conservative Merkel in Germany and socialist Hollande in France, there's still this, this consensus um, in terms of trying to move Europe forward. Some disagreements on details, but they kind of agree on this. But I will say, though, that uh, these views are not necessarily shared by other politicians <laughs> of their stripes elsewhere. For example, uh, conservative Cameron does not necessarily share uh, conservative Merkel's desire <laughs> for a more uh, unified <laughs> Europe. That's that's that goes with the context of British history in general. Being off the continent, they've always felt you know that they were not really part of it. Right, and in fact, you know, one of the big. Uh, uh, points that's made about uh, actually made about Churchill's speech that I, I referenced earlier about the United States of Europe is he didn't envision a role for Britain in that. <laughs> it was only later on uh, at the year uh, the United Kingdom would eventually join the nascent European project after having its membership vetoed by France. <laughs> uh, that's another story. <laughs> um, but you know the thing is, uh, federal models can be an excellent way of uh, maintaining a fair and balanced distribution of power between a central government and local governments, which basically means that people have more input and say over a government that's closer to them. I think that's always beneficial. Um, but it should be noted that sometimes tensions are just too strong and federal federations can fall apart. Um, examples of that include Yugoslavia mm-hmm. and the Soviet Union. Uh, but really, the extent to which they were actually federal uh, is questionable. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, of course, you know, you have uh, <laughs> Uh, this this horrifying uh, genocidal rage and uh, within the former Yugoslav states, uh, you have resentment toward the domineering Russians um, in many of the former Soviet republics, uh, which revealed that you know it wasn't so much that there was a common consensus and interest in maintaining an entity uh, as it was that there was. Uh, a faux federation controlled by um, an elite from usually just one country. But I do want to say, I want to touch on one area. It's close to Europe, outside of it, though, that could benefit from looking at a federal model Mm. uh, as a compromise, and that's Israel. Uh, Mm. You know, the tension between Israelis and Palestinians um, shows no sign of abating, um, and debates over a one- or two-state solution are really... uh, Difficult because you know some people say two state solution is ideal because it allows uh, both peoples to have, be self governing within their mm-hmm. own countries, but both would be very weak and have odd borders with each other. Um, the status mm-hmm. of Jerusalem in a two state solution is always messy, uh, and a, a unitary state solution is unacceptable to Palestinians, and rightly so. They feel uh, disenfranchised and, and unrepresented by uh, the Israeli government. Uh, if a compromise could be found to develop a model similar to the Belgian mm-hmm. model, mm-hmm. which is a three system, a three subject federation, you have uh, Israeli territories, Palestinian territories, and make Jerusalem a special territory of its own, mm-hmm. uh, that could actually provide a legitimate structure. Now, I'm not, not saying that mm-hmm. things wouldn't be yeah. tense <laughs> and difficult, but it could create a sense of legitimacy and agreed upon structure that could allow peaceful mm-hmm. coexistence in the long term. Mm-hmm. Well, there are definitely a lot of. Uh contentious issues that might make something like that difficult to go about. And that's not something we're going to be discussing today. That's for another time. So I guess, uh, what are some final thoughts we have on this subject before we end the podcast for this? Well, I, I think that when we look at uh, the federalism, um, it when we think of you know the way it works here in America, uh, it it produces a, a very different feel from when you look at it in in Europe. <clears throat> And Europe's history, its unique history, contributes to that. The idea that the nation state uh, can be a core. Um, because when you look at the European Union, and especially the German interest in it, um, Germany was kind of a proto European Union. It was a union of a bunch of different states, of different religions, uh, powers, and capacities, and populations that came together and produced uh, a, one of the most prosperous and progressive states in the world. And so it's understandable that some people might look at that as a prototype mm-hmm. for Europe. But federalism can have its drawbacks. Um, uh, federal power should not be so remote or so strong that it loses legitimacy or input from the people. And that's something that, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, is dangerous whenever you're dealing with any large-scale geographic entity like Mm -hmm. Europe would be, or like America is now. Mm -hmm. But when we we think about... 
the evolution of human government and systems of government, uh, the Federation kind of can provide the best of both worlds, whether it's a monarchy uh, like uh, uh, Belgium or a republic like Germany. Uh, it allows for the best representation for people um, in their communities at a local level. All right, then. This has been the Casual Historian Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then give us a rating and a review on iTunes. You can also find this podcast on the Casual Historian YouTube channel. And you can follow the Casual Historian on Facebook and Twitter. And go to casualhistorian.com for more content like this. You can email any comments, questions, or business inquiries to casualhistorian at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.